All right. Hi, everyone. We're just about getting ready to start, and we're just going to look at all the numbers of participants going up. And um, really good to see so many people here. Please uh, do say hi in the chat. Let us know where you're tuning in from. Um, I'm Sina Jongastel from Group Now, and uh, I'll be starting us off today with uh, Chris Adams from Miles Partnership in just a second. We just want to make sure we get everyone in and ready um, for the next hour of uh, launch webinar, which we've been looking so forward to. Uh, and yeah, chat is disabled, but it's not anymore. Thank you, Kalisa. So we have Tel Aviv here. Hi, Yael, and Lake Charles. So I see now some messages. So always good. We have, this is a, I guess, a global webinar in essence, but uh, the two projects have been in North America and in Europe. So hopefully we have some strong representation from those two continents here, Columbia, South Carolina. Greenland. Oh, wow. Great to see you guys. Colorado. Oh, we're all over. Barcelona. Hi. Wisconsin. And Copenhagen. Hi. That's also where I'm sitting, by the way. Good to see you all. We have Magnus from Stockholm in the house and Jane is here. So good to see you. Let's see. We're about... Uh, we're almost there. Let's give it like one more minute and then we're going to kick it off. So you can still, you still have time to say hi. We have the UK here, North Carolina. Hello, y'all. Hi, Whitney. Good to see you. Breckenridge. Nice. Hi, Brett. I guess we have so many time zones here as well. We're just getting used to saying good morning, good afternoon. Uh, here in Copenhagen, it's dark already. Aalborg, yes. Florida, hi. And New Zealand is here. Nice, thank you. Good to see you. Michigan. All right, good. And Maya is here from Amsterdam. Hi, Maya. Maya's going to be in. Hi, everybody. <laughs> hi, Maya. So glad you made it. Girona from Spain. Hi. And Bordeaux is here. We're also going to hear from Bordeaux in the panel. Olivier is already here. Great. So I think in the interest of time, because we have so much we want to share, but this doesn't mean, oh, what was that? Uh, this doesn't mean that, uh, happy Mardi Gras, yes, to you too, Jeremy. It doesn't mean that you can't continue to say hi in the chat. We love that. But um, I think we should get started because we have a lot on the program. And uh, yeah, so Chris, would you uh, take it from here? Have welcome people to what's going to happen today. Yes, thanks so much, Sina, and uh, welcome everybody from wherever you're joining uh, around um, and across Europe, North America, and beyond. Uh, we're delighted to launch the reports, the resources from Time for Democracy. This is the largest ever study undertaken looking at best practices in an absolutely critical area, which is community engagement. How do we connect and partner with uh, local residents, community groups, and businesses. And we were delighted to work on this with um, Group Now and a, a range of other wonderful partners that we're going to talk about in a moment. Um, so obviously, the need for sort of a renewal of um, community engagement was, was an issue before the pandemic and really just amplified during COVID-19 as part of the desire to build back better. And so just a couple of <clears throat> numbers I've pulled out of the research results. We surveyed almost 300 DMOs, destination marketing management organizations across Europe, North America. You can see just small percentages are regularly surveying local residents, 13% in North America of DMOs, 25% in Europe. In fact, over half of North American DMOs had never surveyed their local residents. Um, and only small percentages of those almost 300 DMOs believe that their local residents felt included, involved uh, in how tourism is planned, managed and developed. And in fact, resident sentiment research um, confirms that residents do not feel included and involved in tourism in their community. Um, but the good news is... Uh, a vast majority of uh, DMOs feel that community engagement is a high or very priority um, in the year ahead. 
And so that is the theme of Time for Democracy. We're launching today um, two interlinked, coordinated uh, reports and sets of resources, um, and we'll be sharing that. It's all available on timefordemocracy.com. Just a reminder, the slides, the recording, links to download um, these reports, the associated resources, we're calling them toolkits, uh, are going to be sent out via e email, uh, but they're also all available on timefordemocracy.com. So um, without further ado, Sina, do you want to just introduce the rest of our presenters and panelists? Yes, I will. So you've already met uh, me and Chris, and I have my colleague with me today, PJ Roma Hansen from Group Now, who's going to be moderating the panel together with uh, the always fantastic Laura Libby from Miles Partnership. Um, and then we have uh, four DMO panelists, DMO executives joining us for the panel later. Um, and uh, yeah, there we go. Uh, so they will all be introduced in detail later on, but we have um, Maya from Amsterdam and Partners, Jennifer from Visit Park City and Jeanette from uh, NYC and Company. And we have Olivier from Bordeaux who are all gonna be sharing best practices and probably also some of the challenges around community engagement in the discussion uh, in um, about 20 minutes, <laughs> because first we have, uh, of course, we want to share a little bit of the insights from the research. But before we do that, a very, very important, um, a very important slide, or we have two very important slides. We need to thank all the partners that have uh, helped us, have enabled us, supported us, and contributed to um, the the research that we're launching today. The results of this program and adding their experiences throughout this past year of uh, research and uh, um, and so these are the 22 European destinations that joined the program um, and I'm happy that I saw many of you in the chat before and of course our um, knowledge and expert partners uh, in the European edition uh, we have the Travel Foundation, Global Destination, Sustainability Movement, City Destinations Alliance and TCI Research as well as University of Surrey supporting us and then of course Miles Partnership, our strategic partner. And another important slide after this one Chris. <laughs> Yes, uh, we so uh, a special thanks and again wonderful to see many of you joining us today our 20 destination partners across North America a huge <laughs> very group of wonderful destinations uh, and a couple of them New York City and Park City are joining us today but you can see so many other wonderful cities, states, regions, mountain towns, coastal communities uh, and also our association partners, uh, Destinations International, DMA West, uh, TTIA, and uh, I want to give a special sh uh, shout out to our academic partners, University of South Carolina, NC State, and our other agency partners, notably destination analysts who helped lead that uh, DMO survey. So thank you again to all of those uh, partners who made this possible. Yes. And so the agenda is actually really simple. I've already kind of uh, revealed the, the core of it. Um, we're launching the white paper, we're launching the toolkits, and uh, Chris and I will be presenting those. And then we have the panel to um, be discussing some of the topics that, um, that we've also discussed throughout the project. But before we do that, we just thought we'd make it, we'd take advantage of having so many people in the room and do a quick set of uh, Zoom polls, which we're all very used to by now, I think. So I'm going to launch the first one here. And so the first question here for all of you is how would you describe the importance and priority of local resident community engagement to your organization in the next one to two years? So you have a choice of one to five where one is not important or very low priority and five is very important, or very high priority. Um, and then you have don't know as an option too if you wanna bail out on this one. Um, but let's see, let's get as many answers in as we can. I have uh, almost 100 respondents. I'm going to, yes, more than 100. Thank you. Um, I see a pretty clear image here, but I'm just going to give you one more second. Let's see, 110. Great. Let's end the poll so we can see, um, share the results as you can see right here. Uh, so pretty strong tendency towards uh, important or high priority or very important and very high priority, as you can see here. So let's just yes. do one. 
Sorry, <laughs> Chris. I'm just going to say it's actually above. We actually asked this exact question, and the next one, um, and that that result there with almost uh, ninety percent of respondents uh, is above the sixty-five to seventy-seven percent of the DMOs who responded that way in our survey. So, um, yeah, the second question was: Which of these community engagement activities is your destination organisation involved in today? So, obviously, you might have plans for some of these, but which are the ones you're investing? Uh, it doesn't have to be dollars, but at time, resources, etc. So, if you click um, the ones that apply, we'll just give people. Um, a little bit more time here. Obviously, you might be doing a number of them. So uh, we saw, for example, with yeah. resident sentiment I survey. Think it, I think it's set up a single choice, so they can actually only choose one. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, um, I, well, then great. that's why we'll see what's the most, <laughs> the most popular yes. one. <laughs> <laughs> Let's re rephrase that question. Which is the most important one? <laughs> That's it. You still like after so many years now of doing intense Zoom, <laughs> uh, we there's always something. But then here we go. I think we have some pretty interesting still. So this actually also matches what we've seen. The resident sentiment surveys are are quite high. And then we have communication and marketing to local residents. Um, yeah. Engagement. Yeah, but those are definitely the ones. Advisory boards, resident panels is also quite 13% here. All right, so. Yeah. Very good. And you can see the um, survey results from across Europe and um, North America in um, the Time for Democracy website. That day. So you can download the reports, which include what the other 300 DMOs said. So I'm going to pass over to you now, Sina, to summarize key insights from the white paper. Yes. All right. So I'm going to jump straight in. We don't have uh, a lot of time to present what we've worked on for about a year, um, but uh, I'm still going to give you sort of the speed intro of what to expect when you dive into the white paper. And you should see this more sort of the um, uh, the taste. I'm, I'm trying to uh, inspire everyone to go in and read um, because there's a lot of inspiration in there. And so, of course, this kind of started really as sort of a quest to reinvent the social contract of destinations that invites tourism to where people live. And of course, as part of that, and as the name implies, really zooming in also on the role of the DMO in that, in a broader conversation on tourism, uh, and also moving from simply focusing on tourism acceptance to something that was beyond that, co-ownership in shaping the future of tourism. Um, so we've looked at all these different frameworks and models um, modes of thinking really in approaching this. Um, we've looked at social license to operate. We've looked at the deliberative wave as coined by the OECD. We've looked at sort of the shift from uh, consumer to active citizenship. Uh, citizenship. And one of the um, important models that I just wanted to highlight here is really the spectrum of participation um, from the International Federation um, for Public Participation. But here, what you can really see is sort of the, the, the five different uh, ways of in participation from informing, consulting, involving, collaborating to empowering, but also the promises that are entailed in each of these. So for informing, what the promise is when you inform the residents on something relating to tourism, you're promising that you'll keep them informed. Or if you're consulting, you promise that you'll listen and share feedback on how input was used. But if you're involving, you're actually promising that you'll work with people and reflect their input somehow in the output. If you're collaborating, you'll look for advice and you'll use as much as that as possible. And finally, empowering is really looking at um, whatever is decided is also what we're going to um, be implementing. So really sort of opening up a little bit what we're talking about when we're talking about participation, engagement and inviting to that and also what role that entails. Um, and so in essence, what you'll see when you dive into the white paper is that um, we've identified eight participatory approaches that we see in tourism. Um, we also have examples outside of tourism, but we think these can really sort of inspire a new approach, um, a new methodology on, uh, in tourism and how to invite participation and engagement. So I'm going to speed talk <laughs> through all eight of these, um, but there is a lot more to dive into and hopefully my speed talk through this will also give you that idea. 
Each of these approaches are exemplified with case studies from different destinations and, as, and sometimes also outside of destinations. So for example, we look at destinations using resident sentiment. Um, we have Oslo, wonderful Copenhagen and the Netherlands, the Netherlands who um, have examples both on local, regional and national level of doing resident sentiment research. Um, from Stockholm, we've looked at also the digital uh, citizen panel and how they've used that to um, test sentiment and engage residents in discussing tourism and um, really what we're also looking at here is how is then the results how are the results used how are they communicated how are they shared or how are they impacting what happens afterwards so you can see more about that in the case descriptions and then as sort of a build on to resident sentiment we've also dived into citizen science and citizen generated data ecosystems um, which isn't really something that you see a lot of um, but it's interesting in tourism I would say specifically though you do have for visitors more than for residents but there are some really interesting approaches in terms of participation where you're really shifting from looking at the citizen or the resident as your object your passive object of rest of research to actually being an active subject and um, co-creating the research um, then we've looked at the second participatory approach really in strategizing and ideation with two really strong cases Banff National Park and Banff and Lake Louise Tourism who've uh, um, just finalized really a big strategy process of extensive involvement with uh, community and uh, Bordeaux, who we'll hear from later in the panel as well, who also did a very extensive strategy process towards a new roadmap and launched an online agora for tourism, for um, sharing and inspiring beyond a conversation that continues even beyond the um, strategic process. Um, we've looked and had a deep dive into digital engagement and online participation. You could say the pros and cons um, of that and how to actually mix it with uh, physical or in-person participation. Um, what that means in terms of scale, of reach, of um, transparency. Um, we've looked at a really interesting case in Belfast where they're inviting residents to share their stories as part of shaping uh, one of a new major visitor attraction in the city. Um, we've looked at Atout France, the national tourism organization in France and how they've uh, asked through a digital participation platform for input ideas on how to shape more responsible tourism. We've also looked at different platforms, including also some platforms that are specifically focused on youth and how uh, online participation can perhaps engage younger generations more, which, by the way, interestingly, in resident sentiment research from TCI research also, we can see that the younger generations are generally more negative towards tourism than the older generations. So there is something there to dive deeper into. Then, of course, we've looked at citizen assemblies, councils and panels and, and sort of building off the um, OECD, um, um, the OECD reports on the deliberative wave and a lot of inspiration from that. We've heard from the Barcelona City Tourism Council. We have a case on, from Valencia as well and their plenary council and how these work. And they're actually councils that combine representatives of both residents and academia and industry in an ongoing permanent space for conversation on tourism and the cities. Um, but then of course the new and I think very interesting Berlin Citizen Advisory Council for tourism, which was just launched, uh, had the first meeting in October, um, and how that conversation is going to be also making recommendations to the future of tourism to the city. We've looked at participatory branding and community storytelling with this great case from uh, New York, who is also in the panel later, um, and talking about the Freedom to Be series or highlighting that as part of the um, uh, best practice on how you really not only engage community, but that you actually tell great communities through the community. They come from the community and how that's also part of building trust. We've looked at placemaking as a participatory approach. Um, and and really sort of dived into uh, one case here from Visit Tallinn, where they're co-creating wayfinding and signage together with residents uh, across the city. Um, volunteering for tourism welcome, really sort of with greeters, um, with volunteers to shape, to take ownership of how we welcome visitors to our cities from Aarhus, from Lyon, from Brussels. Uh, and then the eighth participatory process or approach, sorry, uh, community funding and participatory budgeting, which is a very interesting one, um, which is, of course, participatory budgeting is typically um, very public, where there's a public budget allocated and citizens can sort of vote, propose projects and vote how to allocate public funds, where you can say community funding or civic crowdfunding is more where the community actually also puts in funds and then are matched by public funds. It's very interesting. We have a great case from 
um, one of our destination partners, a tourism uh, from the municipality of Reden with citizen checks that local residents can invest in community projects. And then once you've gone through all those great examples and inspirations uh, for the eight approaches, we actually finish off looking at what we call the fluid role of the DMO and democracy. And the point here is really, um, we, we, wanted to, <laughs> we wanted to not fall into the trap of figuring out another set role for the DMO in democracy or coming up with another word that the M could stand for, just making the D stand for diluted in a sense. But really what we're looking at is how the role um, is, is defined through a fluidity that is organization-wide. It's not a new function. It's not just adding one simple fix-all function to your organization. It's combining different roles in different situations and different collaborations and contexts. And so it's not necessarily progressing from one part or the other, but actually becoming um, an organization that understands, that reflects and decides, makes very transparent choices on who are we in the context of what collaboration and how and where do we um, create value in that. Um, so we've looked at different roles and how different contexts where, for example, where the DMO takes a larger agency as the initiator and invites collaboration, how that looks like or what that looks like to another role where perhaps it's not the necessarily the DMO that invites the, um, the participation or the engagement, but really that supports it and becomes the expert or the advocate as part of that. So this was way too fast, <laughs> um, but nonetheless, I hope I kind of piqued everyone's or spiked everyone's interest. Um, there's a lot to dive into and I'm really looking forward to everyone's feedback. We're excited to be sharing this with you today. And then Thanks Chris. So <laughs> Thanks. Thanks so much, Sina. Yes, there was a lot there and please take advantage of downloading the white paper all available at Time for Democracy, as are the reports and toolkits that I'm going to briefly introduce right now. So um, in the North American edition, we took a, a complementary approach um, and sort of built on the underlying sort of foundational principles of community participation and governance. Um, and um, looked at uh, six topics in depth uh, that's available as a complete report. You can see it there, or there's six, six, six uh, individual sections that you can download. And uh, early in the process, we talked to the destination partners, uh, we reviewed research, um, spoke with experts, and identified a set of sort of more practical uh, challenges where community is absolutely at the center or a vital part of addressing, solving, uh, or building on these principles. So we, we did look at community participation models, building on the work uh, that Cena's just outlined, um, resident sentiment research, that fundamental part of understanding how your local um, residents think about tourism and local businesses. Uh, and then we dove into some really immediate, practical, urgent issues, workforce development, DEI. Uh, and I want to give a special shout out to Melissa Cherry, our Senior Vice President, who led our DEI section of our report uh, and our learning lab we ran on that. Uh, media and comms, short-term rentals. Um, and so you can download each of those individual reports uh, and all the full report. And each of those sections has... Um, we we'll tried to make them concise, practical, and actionable. They have three sections, what to know, critical learnings and insights, what to do. So between six and nine best practices distilled from all the research, the consultation, the expert uh, advice and presentations, our interviews with our destination partners, and perhaps most importantly, case study examples that we collected from across North America, Europe, and beyond, and then resources to use. Those uh, are distilled in terms of the case studies and research that illustrate action in each of these areas. Um, so combine the re re report sections, the case studies, and the research uh, form what we're calling toolkits on each of these six topics. Uh, so you can dive into one particular topic and look at all these resources or download the full report. There's a huge range of case studies, uh, as I mentioned, and also uh, led by the University of South Carolina, 
uh, supported by NC State, our two academic partners, they did the largest ever review of research on community engagement. And so we've actually summarized uh, the most important research reports into easy to digest, quick takeaway documents, along with other research summaries uh, that are available in those toolkits. So just a couple of uh, uh, topics just to illustrate some of the sort of insights, uh, the sort of what to know, what to do section. Short-term rentals have become a big issue in many communities. Um, and with their growth, uh, and they, were, they represent between 14 and 15% of accommodation in uh, the North American market now. Uh, they're an urgent community issue, and they've really emerged uh, as a topic that needs to be addressed, managed by DMOs as a participant along with other critical local partners. Um, so we looked at communities from Galveston to Palm Springs to uh, destinations across Europe and North America on how they manage short-term rentals and housing and identified uh, nine best practices. Uh, we also look more broadly at the issue of housing, and housing is a critical issue in many communities. Short-term rentals is a small part of the equation. Uh, we looked at all the evidence about uh, how they're impacting housing availability and accessibility, uh, and defined that in most communities, they're not a major contributor to that issue, uh, but certainly one that needs to be researched and studied in your local community. But um, Mammoth Lakes is one example of a DMO that stepped up uh, not as a leader, but as a contributor to uh, solving um, housing issues. And there's uh, some really ambitious housing investments going in in Mammoth Lakes, uh, and the DMO is an active participant in enabling, uh, addressing housing, which is also a critical issue for work workforce that I'll talk about in a moment. So just three of those nine takeaways, self-regulation, um, it's a great start, and we highlight some wonderful examples of guest education um, and host responsibility codes um, and guest responsibility codes at work, registration of short-term rentals, so Galveston's one example, a simple, low-cost, inclusive uh, registration system where you have a numbering uh, approach and you can only advertise and list your short-term rental if you use that registration number and they've got that agreement with the major platforms Airbnb and Home and Away uh, which really locks in so you invite everybody in uh, you can then work with them and that of course ties into uh, tax revenue so Galveston again as an example is collecting over five million dollars in short-term rentals bed tax a vital part of funding for the city as well as the DMO in terms of taking on new responsibilities. So short-term rental tax revenue is often newfound money that the DMO can step up to and say, uh, we would like a proportion of that to take on these added responsibilities, which is often one of the critical issues that DMO thinks about is how am I gonna fund and support uh, my additional work in community engagement? Workforce, an absolutely pressing issue. It's been um, a challenge in our industry for many years, exacerbated by the pandemic, exacerbated by some of the sort of technology changes. Just one stat, Amazon has hired almost 1 million workers in the last four years in North America alone. That's the fastest rate of hiring of any uh, company in North American history by a factor of five. Um, and of course, they've set a new benchmark for um, pay and conditions. So there's increased competition, there's an aging workforce, uh, and there's some underlying challenges in our industry. So more and more DMOs are stepping up, and we highlight many of them uh, getting involved in outreach and engagement consultation with businesses and the community on the workforce issue, helping or supporting or leading career fairs. This is an example from Greater Boston CVB, and they worked with Tourism Diversity Matters. So Greg and the team uh, worked with Boston to reach out and engage with diverse communities in Boston uh, as part of that workforce development effort. Um, 
But this is a big complex problem that needs a multi-agency long-term approach. And Canada, and in particular, Tourism HR Canada, provides a wonderful sort of framework for looking at this issue uh, and how to build a sort of private public uh, sector initiative and workforce that addresses a wide range of issues. And you can see just three of those sort of pillars listed here, including image liability. Frankly, in many communities, tourism is not seen as a great job or career opportunity, and the DMO has to be involved in changing that perception, working within uh, high schools, uh, tertiary institutions on education opportunities, et cetera. So improve that public-private coordination, make sure uh, you're engaged, supporting those recruitment uh, efforts, uh, this issue of housing and childcare are, are also fundamental. So it illustrates how many of these themes are sort of tied and connected together. And then something, again, fundamental to the role of a DMO, investing in high value tourism that is year round, resilient, and can provide consistent, well-paid jobs, which is the fundamental goal if we want to really truly address this. So just four final takeaways that every DMO really, regardless of your budget and how you've been involved in local community uh, and in community engagement in the past really should be investing in are summarized here. So understand what your local community really thinks about tourism. That's all sorts of informal uh, communication, engagement, whether it's coffee sessions, whether it's uh, uh, open Thursday mornings where you invite people to get together, uh, as well as resident sentiment research. Uh, make sure you build a plan and a vision for your community on tourism where the community is at its core. And it's quite simple that uh, communities that are great places to live where tourism is enhancing the quality of life are also great places to visit. Uh, and of course, then, we want to ensure that we've got this diverse community voices um, and Cena outlined that sort of spectrum of participation. So we've got to not only ask for input, but provide genuine ways in which we demonstrate to communities that they're being listened to uh, and that they're being included in important decisions. And then related to that, no amount of uh, positive PR is going to solve practical problems that tourism is at least a part of. And so we need to be involved in finding practical solutions to issues, whether it's housing, whether it's workforce, short-term rentals, uh, management and marketing, uh, ensuring our diverse communities are included, et cetera. So be involved in some of these sticky, difficult problems. I try and identify where you can add value and identify other partners who may need to take the lead on other issues. Uh, I've summarized all that in a blog. You can also download that. Uh, and with that, we'll just go to our final poll and then to the panel discussion. Okay, I got it ready. Uh, so great, thank you, Chris. And here is the um, the final poll. Does your destination organization currently have a KPI for resident sentiment and or community engagement? And again, here you have a single choice, but that makes sense this time. So uh, yes or no, um, do you have a KPI? Let's see, I get answers in. This is also just a... Let's see, I'm, I'm, I'm aiming for above 100 answers. So let's see if we can get you guys. I know somewhere it's early morning and here it's getting late in the day, but let's see. Um, all right, let's end the poll here and I'll share with you. It's actually an interesting result uh, because even though it was very high priority to, for example, do sentiment research, uh, we have not an equal split, but we actually have a majority who doesn't have a KPI so it's not still it's still not part of how you're measured or how your success is measured was that what you were expecting Chris yes slightly higher than what we saw in that 300 DMO survey results I think in that case 77 percent of DMOs did not have a KPI in North America um, so good to see that uh, the people joining us today but absolutely a fundamental issue 
So uh, let's uh, pass it over to Laura and Peter for uh, our panel discussion. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate that. And thank you, Sina. Um, such great information. And I look forward to reading all the toolkits and everything that's been put, put out forward. Um, I'd love to have our panelists turn their cameras on and join us. Um, we have four panelists joining us today. Um, we have Janet Rausch, who is joining us from NYC and Company, and she's the Executive Vice President of Marketing and Digital. And then we also have Jennifer Wesselhoff joining us. And Jennifer is the President and CEO of visit uh, Park City. And then um, joining us from uh, Bordeaux, we have Olivier Ocelli, and he's the CEO. And then Maya Jansen is the Managing Director of Insights and Marketing for Amsterdam and Partners. So thank you all so much for joining us. We appreciate you uh, being a part of this conversation. So Peter, I'll hand it to you to ask uh, some of our first questions. Thank you very much, Laura. And I get to ask the first question. Uh, so, and that is, a question for all of you in the panel. Um, so I'd like to, to take a tour with you. And the first question is, so what are your priorities and your focus in this area of community engagement in the short run, the next year or two to come? And I'd like you to, to elaborate a little bit. And I think I will start with you, Jennifer, and then pick on you, Meyer, as number two. Jennifer, Park City. Well, thank you. And thank you so much for including me in this esteemed panel. Um, for Park City here in Utah, we're really focused on um, getting access and being present within our community. We're a little bit different in our structure in that we're a Chamber of Commerce and a destination management organization. So that gives us a few steps ahead of maybe some other DMOs because we have about 970 businesses that we're already communicating with. Um, but the key for us in the upcoming years will be to better leverage those relationships, especially related to their employees and connecting the dots between our people, our stakeholders, our employees, and telling their story in a more meaningful way to try to create this mesh between residents, employers, and employees by illustrating that our businesses are residents too, and that they care deeply about our, our community. They don't necessarily, as some may think, only care about more, 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 more attraction, more business, more jobs. So telling that story in a meaningful way is going to be a critical priority for us. And by doing that, um, we've created a communications plan that helps guide that messaging. We use all of our local media to help us tell that story. We actually even hired a local PR company, a communications company, to help us be more strategic about how we tell that story. Um, in the past, we would not necessarily be so strategic about the storytelling. We would tell one story in the local paper and then another topic in, at, on the radio station, for example. So to have a more strategic plan related to local communications, both PR, that, you know, that, that storytelling that we don't pay for, but also buying ads in the local paper and telling our story to our locals is a really important aspect of, of what we're doing and creating space for locals to come and talk to us. You know, traditionally as a chamber and a DMO, our primary customers have always been our visitors or potential visitors, and then now visitors once they're in the community as we think about management, and then our businesses and our members. But adding that new customer as our community and our residents is a really important part of what we're doing and trying to find space, going where they are, going to the farmer's market, taking a mobile information center to places where our residents are is a new concept for us. So providing that access, that two-way communication is um, a really important priority for us moving forward. Thank you very much, Jennifer. That was very inspirational. And also, I think a bit of an echo from, from the case that we have in the report about from Banff in Canada. Really interesting to hear. I'm going to move on because we're a little bit short on time. And Maya, Amsterdam, 
welcome. So your priorities for the next one to two years. So now we have voice. Thank you, Peter. Um, short answer for somebody who's involved in the strategy, key student priorities for the next couple of years. And um, I had a thought because um, Amsterdam Partners has a DMO, we are a former DMO, and with the I Amsterdam brand have been involved in residence from the start off. So the Tripartis, uh, residence visitors and businesses has always been part of our, our activities. But um, so we say, okay, the, the people create the city and we are together the city from, from the beginning. But the interesting thing is the challenge of getting the Tripartee in balance is a very big challenge and be becoming more a challenge for the next coming of years, despite all the things you are doing. And that's, um, we had a uh, resident survey and we do have a KPI on the resident, on the sentiment. And, um, I think the sentiment with respect for the residents, with respect to uh, tourism and the sector tourism is um, related to the average low in Amsterdam. So we have we have a, we have a challenge. Um, and um, I think the world has become very complex because our influence, the influence we can take as a DMO, and I think we see us, ourselves more as a PMMO, a place making and marketing organization. Um, is very, um, um, well, maybe limited because of the enormous international impact and the social media. And I think a lot of it is beyond our control. So the, 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 the thing is said before here in the insights, you can't do it alone. Maybe you could a couple of years ago, but you can't anymore. And um, so you need new partners. So our, our key focus is building new partnerships. Um, also with um, in the business and, uh, and entrepreneurs, but mainly in the residents. And um, we have several city districts with all kinds of partners we still do not know enough. Um, so we need to be an expert, a storyteller, but also a connector. And I think uh, that's the main challenging thing uh, for us as company um, to make those connections you need also new skills and other people so I think uh, that will be our focus for the next coming years. Thank you very much Maya you are as you know a case in the white paper at least one or perhaps two uh, so and a, and a great inspiration for many um, destinations in, in Europe. Uh, could you just uh, shortly short exemplify some of the partnerships that, that you're working on? Is that with local communities? Yes, with local communities. So um, we have a, for example, we have a local, we call it a net local connector uh, who is building all kinds of um, um, uh, local communities in uh, New West Side, Oost and North. Um, and that's the small entrepreneurs or the small institutions or the parts we do not still know all people and the interesting thing is there is a negative sentiment in Amsterdam towards tourism but there is a, a huge um, ambition to engage so we 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 know there is a negative sentiment but we want to uh, to 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 get the, the the vibe to engage and to um, make all those local communities a part a participatory approach or oh, difficult word and then um, but this it, it takes time and it takes another approach than the huge business or partners to interest uh, with respect to promotional activities, for example. So um, I think um, a lot of uh, local communities building in the um, uh, many city districts for us, very important. Yeah. Interesting to hear from you because there's also been some friction in, in Amsterdam and Barcelona and elsewhere. We are gonna continue uh, to you, uh, Jeanette, from uh, NYC, and then end in Bordeaux with Olivier in just a minute. Jeanette, Hi. so you for the next. Europe. Thank you, Peter. Uh, so we have at NYC and company two overarching goals. We want to make sure that we are threading the needle of not being the voice of NYC, but rather amplifying the eight and a half million voices of NYC, and that when we do so, we're helping to support local economies. So we're in the process right now of rewriting our brand strategy to reflect those goals. And the idea is that this would support the creation of more content like our local legend series. Uh, so this is a video series that follows a neighborhood ambassador 
a local legend through a series of interviews uh, with small business owners in their neighborhoods, which is part of our larger NYC Like a New Yorker campaign. So I want to thank my colleague, Rondell Holder, who was mentioned earlier. Uh, he's our SVP of Content and Diversity Initiatives. He created uh, the Freedom to Be series that was referenced earlier and was the leader on this particular series. So when we launched it in December, it featured Mott Haven in the Bronx, and we launched our second video in the series yesterday. Uh, it features the founder of We Run Uptown in Washington Heights. So when you're making these videos, when you're going into Washington Heights or Mott Haven, you wanna make sure that we're coming you know, with deep relationships in that community. We don't wanna be exploitative, we want to make sure that we are accurately representing the neighborhood, and we want to make sure that we are driving spending in those neighborhoods, rather than recreating some problems we might have had before the pandemic, like with the Joker stairs. So the Joker stairs, if you're not familiar, it's a reference to the Shakespeare Avenue stairs in the High Bridge neighborhood of the Bronx. Uh, it was prominently featured in the film Joker. You see the Joker dancing down the stairs. And the, this was time kind of with the rise of TikTok and popularity. So people were taking Ubers to Highbridge in order to go in their full Joker costumes to recreate that dance down the stairs, which was used by people in the community to go to work. Like this is, you know, it, it, it wasn't a great thing to interrupt people's commutes to work. It wasn't great engagement with the community. And then when these people were done making their TikTok, They'd call the Uber and leave the neighborhood and they wouldn't spend so much as a dollar on a cup of coffee. So while we had nothing to do with this, right? Like we weren't involved with the filming. We didn't have a partnership with the movie. We never promoted the Joker stairs as a photo opportunity anywhere. But the second that the press said, oh, this it's tourists who are doing this. This is a tourism problem. All of a sudden that becomes a problem for the DMO. So. We want to make sure that the programs that we do create and support, that it's actually driving spending in those communities. And again, that it's the people in the neighborhood speaking for themselves. It's not me sitting in an office in midtown Manhattan deciding what you should be doing in Mott Haven, which is in a neighborhood I know particularly well. Uh, and we want to make sure that it's not just a matter of people going through on a double-decker bus, right? That you're actually leaving to explore the neighborhood and to do the things in the neighborhood that the community wants to show off and wants you to see. Fantastic. Thank you, Jeanette. I'll consider bringing my Batman costume next, uh, next time. <laughs> okay. um, but I'm going to rush on because I'm very conscious of time. Uh, to, to you, Olivier, you, you've done a fantastic project in Bordeaux, really community outreach and built a great platform, Aqua, um, tourism for, for um, engagement with your community. Tell us about it. Is that a priority for the next year or two also? Yes, hello everybody. Thanks for inviting Bordeaux to this panel. And yes, definitely um, this uh, mixed community we created under the, the name of Agora is something very important for us. We uh, really create, we, we really wrote our roadmap to 26 uh, with this community, which was uh, quite a, a new thing for us and for a lot of destinations. So our priorities now is to continue to, to have good topics because we found out that uh, it's difficult to involve this uh, mixed community with inhabitants, with associations, with uh, professional tourism. We wanted them all together at the same time during workshops. And so we, we really want to, to continue to listen to them. We, 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 we've challenged, we, we managed to, to, to have their attention and to make them work in, this, in the first step of Agora because we spend a lot of time listening to them during six months uh, on the topic of tourism, of course, for the moment, but we spend a long time. So when we arrived with, with our workshops, we were ready to put the, the good subjects, the good topics, and they were okay to, 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 to work on that. So really to continue to have these good topics because uh, when you organize workshops, sometimes it's a topic that the, the beginning of the topic is not so good. It's, it's difficult to, to animate after. And then to maintain the contact, of course. We, as I told you, it's a roadmap to 26. 
So uh, we want them to be involved every year, every month. We are very, of course, close to our professional uh, of tourism sector. We, we, we can see them very often, but the other uh, persons that we, we put in this, uh, in this community, uh, for example, uh, at the end of February, we will have an annual meeting and uh, there is uh, already more than 200 people there that apply to see what we have done during the first year of this roadmap and uh, what we are planning to do in the second year and of course to make them work again uh, because it's what it's important so they can be active they can see that the roadmap can be can be uh, readapt if there are some actions we have 32 actions in this roadmap and uh, we can see sometimes that uh, it's not uh, possible or we we have to find something else so it's important to to make them be involved uh, on it and of course it's a challenge for the inhabitants we are a lot of talking about the inhabitants and they it's difficult to to have them concerned by the, the tourism topic um, because it's not uh, they are not sometimes sensible to that. So we have some challenge for that. We had some billboards in the city. We, can, we had some survey we have uh, uh, to, be, to make them involved. And we, we can see that they are more involved in uh, urbanism uh, subjects. Uh, Bordeaux is quite a uh, um, leader for that. In a, we have a participatory budget with uh, 40 projects and all the inhabitants of Bordeaux can vote on five projects. So I think this vote, it's something interesting in community to, to involve community in a larger way. It's been a great inspiration. I'm going to rush on into you, Laura, because I know you have some questions too. I do. Thank you. And I'll follow the same the same pattern um, that you did, Peter, but you've all given really great um, examples and um, ways that you've engaged with the community. If you could provide one or two skills that destination organizations should look to develop um, either for their organizational capacity or as individuals that really helps enhance or even begin that community engagement, it would be great to hear from you. So, Jennifer, I don't know uh, right off the top if you have uh, a couple of skills that you would highlight. Yeah, I think from, from my experience, having a plan on how you are going to engage your community and your stakeholders is critical. Um, because once you have a plan, you also then maybe do a formal resident survey as part of that or other maybe informal opportunities for input to develop that plan. Um, critically important, we have so many good examples of plans in our, our destination world. So don't be intimidated by that because you can steal and share ideas from some of us who have really robust plans and make it your own. I think also looking at what makes you relevant in your community. For us, we shifted a position who was formerly really focused on visitor attraction and event attraction and shifted that to a community and government affairs position, which was really important. And then the skill that we already have, we are master storytellers. So thinking about how we use that skill outside of our communities and bringing that into our communities and telling our story better to our stakeholders within our community is a really important skill set to bring as you're developing a, a, a plan to engage. Thanks, I appreciate that. And Maya, what, what skills um, would you recommend? Oh, you are muted. Mm -hmm. Um, in addition to Jennifer, I really agree, you, you do need a plan, uh, but um, uh, given the skills, I think the uh, storyteller, we have been uh, also in the storyteller from the beginning of, but I think even in our role of connector, we need to make new connections, so we need also people who can make those new connections, and that's different from a big partner uh, from, from the tourism industry and a local partner or a startup or just a, a group of residents to connect for the co-creation. So I think that's important. And I think the, the skill of finding new funding, be creative with it, without uh, no money, no plans, I would say. Yeah, well, that's that's a really good point. Jeanette? Yes, I'd say research. So whether it's your own strong in-house research team or external agencies that you are working with, like research is key here and having an in, you know, your own stakeholders, 
using that research and believing in that research is really, really critical. I'd also say it's important to have the people in your organization to assign them roles in each of the areas where you are learning, looking to affect change. So if you're looking to do more bid outreach, somebody has to own that or it's just going to fall to the bottom of someone else's to-do list. So you have to be very thoughtful about that approach. I appreciate that. And Olivier, I will have you round out this conversation. Yes, um, let's say that our um, structure, we, we have a we are really um, legitimacy of our association because we we are uh, we are in the center of the city, but we are we have a certain political neutrality. So I think this is a, one of our skills that it's important. Of course, after it's to have clear objectives, it's like a plan, a roadmap, really that every everything is clear for the for the community where you want to go ahead and when to you want to bring the community. And I will say a little bit like Janet for the the, the skills of the of the people in our uh, uh, in our structure. For example, Julie, who is here, who is listening to to, to us, uh, just change a, a little bit the mission with uh, about animation. Of course, it's all about animation. So uh, we 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 have new role and new missions in our uh, tourism board, and we have to find. And sometimes the people we have is not the. Uh, they don't have these skills, so it's uh, it's really something that we we have to check to have the good people within our associations. Yeah, that's all. That's really great advice. I appreciate that very much. Um, I don't know, uh, Sina, Chris, if we have time for any of the audience questions, I will uh, pass it, Sina, to you to let me know about that. I think it's a little tight. What do you say, say Chris? Do we have time well, for one? Perhaps, uh, perhaps you or one of the panelists may just want to comment on uh, one question. I've heard this uh, from others. If I'm a very small office with very small budget, what is the one thing or the one area or one piece of advice I should uh, think about? So are there any comments from any of the panelists for... Uh, small DMOs. Difficult because you, you need, as, as um, Maya said, you, you need budget at the moment. <laughs> it's, uh, it's difficult to, to bring uh, together a community uh, we, we, without a budget and, and not, not to either bring the community together, but to do some actions after it's something very um, uncomfortable when you make people work to 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 aim to a, a goal and you don't have the resources to 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 to, to do this goal after so I, I think you you really have to think about before what are your resources allocated to this actions that you will work together with the community yes yeah and certainly think about those budget issues you know are there new sources of funding uh, but simple things um, i think jennifer um, shared the example of just uh, having a coffee session on a thursday and inviting the community in to come and chat and share their concerns that doesn't cost a lot um, Maya, Maya's just raised her hand. I think you have a final point, Maya. To this yeah, question. maybe because we have budget, but we have a much bigger ambition. So from our experience, I would say look for partners who can help you make the ambition a reality and don't want to do everything yourself. Thank you. Yeah, a, a great point to wrap it up on. Um, so, um, <clears throat> Sina, why don't you just close it out, um, but just a reminder for those destination partners with us today, please join us in the after party, the little 30 minute networking event, uh, you'll have, you have a separate meeting request. And Sina, do you want to close it out? Uh, yes, I'm not known for being great at closing. I like opening stuff, <laughs> asking more <laughs> questions and diving deeper in. But yes, I will. I would like to thank everyone. Of course, a special thanks to the panelists for being here um, and joining us for this launch. We've been really looking forward to this. And thank you to all the others uh, who joined us, who tuned in, who commented, asked great questions, and then hopefully we'll have time to discuss them and dive in deeper um, on another occasion as well. 
We really look forward to your feedback on the reports, the toolkits, the white paper. So please do share once you've had a chance to, uh, to read. We really want to hear your thoughts. And we are working on sort of what should come after this first Time for Democracy program um, and, uh, and looking at how to design the next steps of uh, unfolding more education and knowledge sharing on this really important field that when you read into the research, you'll also see there are so many things that we can dive into even more. Um, so more news on that soon. Um, and that will also be shaped by, of course, your feedback and your curious questions in return. So there you go. I, I, I finished by opening. Um, and yeah. so thank you everyone for joining us. And uh, we hope to see you somewhere in 2023 out there and look forward to hearing your thoughts on the on what was launched today. So thank you very much. Yes, uh, and the destination partners, please see us over in the little networking event. Thanks again. Thank you.